I grew up in Manila. It's the major city in the Philippines. I was the third among 16 children, the oldest girl, and therefore the responsibility of taking care of my younger siblings were up on me. And I grew up in a very closely knit family where education is valued the most. Uh, my parents used to tell us that once you become educated, you know, you can go anywhere you want and you will succeed. And that's what I've been, you know, uh, that's what I've grown up to be with. Uh, we were raised to be competitive, to be always better than other people. Um, I went, I came here to the United States back in 1974 about two years after I graduated, two, three years after I graduated, because I thought that the future is better in the United States compared to, to the Philippines. And uh, well, I proved it to be correct in some ways. I was teaching after I graduated from medical school. And at the time, I was earning 800 pesos a month, which was equivalent to about uh, $20 a month compared to the United States. And I knew of a number of my classmates who have immigrated to the United States and earning a lot, a lot of money. And I also was told that training in the United States is much better than training in the Philippines. So I decided that uh, maybe my life would be much better if I moved to the United States and stay in, rather than stay in the Philippines. I came here, I left three kids. My youngest was barely one year old. So I stayed away from them for about eight months, um, trying to review for the exams. By the time they came over to see me, they could barely recognize me. That was eight months after I left. It was, it was a very difficult time because I had to make a choice between good future and being away from my family. And I thought maybe a few months, maybe even a couple of years of being separated from my family would eventually uh, be good for us, you know? Uh, I really... I miss them a lot, miss them a lot. And when I started training in uh, pathology, I trained in pathology, I went to Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Clinic. I was faced with this dilemma, right? I had a family, but I also had my training with me. So being a resident in, uh, practice, medical practice is very challenging. I would go home feeling so guilty that I left work in the hospital. I would go to the hospital feeling so guilty that I was staying away from my family. And that happened with me for at least seven years while I was training, and so hard. <laughs> My mom is, was a regular housewife, but very good in business. She used to run a boarding care home in San Francisco. And when we all came here, because I was the oldest in the family, she used to call me up at two o'clock in, in the morning, complaining about my brothers and sisters. You know, I have to tell them that they didn't do this, that they didn't do that. And at the same time, that was when I was training, my re having my residency training. So I was really bogged down with work, and I hardly ever saw her. My attention was in my own family and my career. And when she had a stroke, they called me up, and I said, I'm going to be there. I never made it because I was busy here. By the time I got into San Francisco, she was already brain dead. I never got to talk to her in person. And that, 
that made a big, big wound in my heart. Because when I was looking at her, I remembered what she told me just before she died. She said, Joy, you know, I've got 16 children, but I am still lonely. And it stuck in my mind. And I said, what am I doing? If my mother, who already has everything that she needs, feels so lonely, what about all the other elders who may also have been lonely just the way she was? And maybe because of guilt, I vowed myself, I said, I will never, for as long as I live, you know, I'll never let any elder be depressed and be lonesome. I gotta do everything that we can to make them happy and at least make them feel that they're still productive in their own, own life. And so we founded, actually the Nanai was founded by my family. Nanai means mother in Filipino. Filipino. We founded it on the 40th day of my mom's death because in the Philippines, we have this tradition where 40 days after you die is when your soul goes to heaven and you leave this earth. So we figured when she leaves the earth, then there has to be something left behind as her legacy. And that's how Nana was born, you know. We founded Nana 40 days after her death. Uh, I had to come up with an acronym because Nana is mother, so I called it initially as National Allegiance to the Needs in the Aging Years because I wanted to serve the elders. And then as time went by, youth became part of our program, so it was actually changed into National Alliance to Nurture the Aged and the Youth, which is it's, it is now. Uh, we're doing intergenerational programs so that we can link youth with the older people. You know, combine youth volunteerism with mentorship and service to elders. Being an immigrant physician under training, competing with American graduates is very, very tough especially for somebody who just immigrated from a foreign land. <coughs> I remember when I was training that my mentor used to tell me that as an immigrant, I will never succeed and I will never be any better than the others because she said I was a woman, I had a family, I was not an American, and I didn't speak good English. And she said, for a doctor to be successful in America, she has to be an American, look like an American, speak like an American, and act like an American, which I definitely was not. And I took that as a big challenge because I figured out that even with the way I look, being completely different from regular Americans, I thought that I could be as good as they are, if not better. But that challenge also had a, an effect on my family because I had to strive hard. I used to stay late until 11 o'clock at night, go home, and have to st spend some time with my family, spend some time with my kids who were growing up, and wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning trying to read for the next for the next day, and I still had to cook, clean up the house, be like a housewife, and be like a mother, and day in and day out, you know, all these guilty feelings about, am I doing a good job as a mother? Am I doing good, a good job as a doctor? You know, this is, these are constantly, constantly um, playing in my mind, you know, at least until I, I graduated. <laughs> During that time in my life is, to be able to prove myself as a good physician while also juggling my time as a good mother. I think that was the biggest challenge that I had. How, how did you do that? How did I, 
how did I juggle my life as a doctor and as a family person? I would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, clean up the house, cook, and then with my husband, of course, with his help, dress up the kids, bring them to the babysitter. I would rush to the, to the hospital, stay there until about 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, sometimes 9 o'clock at night. By the time I get home, I just have to uh, heat up whatever I, I uh, cooked in the morning. And then after that, we would dress up the kids, read to them until I, they fall asleep. Sometimes I fall asleep before them. Then wake up at about 1 o'clock to read and prepare for my, my physician's work. And wake up again at 5 o'clock. And this, becomes, this has become a routine. You know. uh, that's, how I, that's how I survive. When I was... When I was studying, I didn't think, I didn't know there was such a thing as grants. Uh, we were actually funding ourselves from my, my friends and actually from my pocket. And I kept on asking my friends for money, for donations, up to a point where <laughs> they would stay away from me. You know, every time they saw me, they think that they're seeing a dollar figure in my face, and so <laughs> they try to avoid me. And up to the time when my friends, even my friends, had told me to stop because they said it's useless. You know, uh, I was wasting my time. I was crazy, and I told them, for as long as there's one older person that I can make happy, I'm gonna do it. It doesn't matter, you know. And then I got lucky. Actually, I thought it was very hard to get grants, and still is, you know. Um, number one, we didn't have anything to show. You know, the first time I asked for a grant, I told them I needed to serve the Asians and the Filipinos, <laughs> and the grantor said. I didn't know there were many Filipinos here. Where are you? <laughs> you know, that made me realize that the grantors and probably the government didn't even realize that the Asians also needed help. And that, I think that was because we never, we're not, not used to asking for, for help. We're always used to trying to fend, our, um, fend for ourselves. And, so proud people. Asians are very proud people. They never want anybody to think that they need help. So they try to do it. Are we treated differently from the others? Probably so. But I think it's more because of the fact that in Florida, for example, we only constitute about 1.8 percent of the total population. So it's very hard to justify why we should be getting money or help from the government. What they do not realize is that the Asians have as much and very similar problems compared to the others, to the other ethnic minorities. And the problem with Asians is they tend to segregate themselves. They will not go to any other social service agency other than, than their own. And since we didn't have any social service agency before, nobody was actually getting any help from the government. You know. Now, thank God for Nanai, at least they know that there is a place to go to. The biggest challenge that I had was to convince people that we could do something good to others. It was okay when I was asking people because they were helping me out because they happen to be my friends. But the pride in the Asian community, like I said, of letting people know that they needed help is, is so tough to cross, so tough to cross, that even if I knew that a lot of elders are needing help, 
it's how to convince the family to let the seniors take participate in these services. See, the problem in the Philippines, in fo among Filipinos, the elders are brought over here to take care of the grandchildren. Now, in the Philippines, it's so easy, you just go out and you have a family or you have friends to talk to. When the elders come here, they're left on their own in the house. They don't know how to drive. They hardly ever use the, the, the telephone. They do not use TV. They're really, really so lonesome. We tried, I tried to get to them, but the family would get upset with me because I was taking their parents away from the grandchildren that they were supposed to be taking care of. And I think that was the most difficult hurdle I had to face when I was just starting. Uh, and also the fact that since that was the first time it was being done, I don't think anybody believed that it would happen, that we would be able to set up a social service, service agency like it should be. Uh, very few people believed in me. And a lot of Filipinos, even Asians, the younger generation didn't want to be associated with seniors because they felt that if they are with the seniors, they're old themselves, you know. And it's, it was so hard. I mean, the first five years was really, really bad. What kept me going was because every time I interacted with a senior and I see how happy they are when they see me. I mean, how could anybody stop that? You know, how could anybody stop the, 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 the nice feeling that you have? And probably because I did make a vow you know, to my mom that well, I would do everything that I could to help the seniors. And it's still keeping me on. Biggest challenges that face the Asian community is still is in being able to integrate themselves and feel like they're just one community. I think the Asians are made up of so many different ethnic backgrounds, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Thais, Filipinos. Each one of them have their own culture, similar in some ways and different in others. But there still is this tendency of the Asians to congregate themselves into little clusters or clans. And that still is a major challenge even up to now. Like Koreans would connect by, among Koreans, Filipinos would normally interact mostly with Filipinos, Chinese, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think we have to break that barrier. Yeah. It bothers me that uh, the mainstream seems to be stereotyping Asians. Like, like I said, uh, different Asian groups have different cultures. Uh, it bothers me that they think that Filipinos are Chinese and Chinese are Filipinos. And even here in North Miami where we are, when they speak Asians, they think of Filipinos because we are the only ones that they see. It's hard because we kind of lose our identity in a sense. You know, um, I would prefer, I would have preferred that we are treated as Asians, of course, one and the same. More because then we have more strength. There is strength in number. You know, 5,000 Filipinos would not compare to 180,000 Asians, which means if we put ourselves together and act as one group, then we might be able to at least get the government to listen to us. But five, five Filipinos talking about the same thing and, Asia, uh, and, and Chinese talking about same thing, but segregated, you know, 
without unity and without without a solid voice, the Asians get drowned. You know, get drowned in the noise of the mainstream. The mission of Nanai is to provide supportive services to elders and youth. We have three goals. The first goal is to provide supportive services and make them productive. The second goal is to provide health for those who are uninsured and are medically underserved. And the third is to provide supportive housing for the seniors and for low-income families. In the first five years of Nanai, we didn't have any funding at all. Uh, we basically moved from one house to another house. We would give them some recreational activities. We taught them how to dance, taught them how to sing, you know, get, uh, taught them some arts and crafts. On the fifth year, we got lucky we got a little bit of a grant, and that's how the Nanay Community Center was opened up. And right after the first pilot grant, we were able to provide recreational activities. Now we are providing recreational activities, computer classes for seniors. We have uh, counseling. We teach them everything about health, finances, how to protect themselves from predators. Uh, we teach them how to dance, and we make them perform outside, you know, so that they become so confident of themselves, and they feel that they also still have something to contribute to society. Uh, aside from that, um, now, about three years ago, we opened up the Nana Health Center, and we are now providing primary health care, preventive health. Uh, they do Tai Chi exercises. They have, uh, they go to, to, to the mall, they go shopping, you know, they, they do a lot of stuff. And uh, we have interjected the intergenerational program where they meet with the youth, discuss common problems and common issues, and they find out that their concerns are very much the same as the concerns of the youth. What they thought the youth were but the same thing that the youth thought the elders were. It's, it's very interesting, actually. I feel that my greatest accomplishment is opening the eyes of others about the need to help and the need to support the seniors. I think that if I were to say, what have I done, I thought my community, that it is okay to help out. Yeah. I would love them to, for them to say that, yeah, that was Joy. She cared about people. Yeah, that's. I used to say when I was young, I had this, this little mantra for myself. I made it up. The beauty of life lies in the thought that you live in the memory of your friends. And I would have liked to think that even as I leave, if I ever get out, that my friends will still remember me as somebody who tried to convince them that it's okay to help.